Hello, everybody. Welcome to Detect and Protect, the Australian Biosecurity Podcast. This podcast series is about sharing information on biosecurity and the difference that this makes to our everyday lives. My name is Steve Payos, and I am your host today. The carpra beetle. It is a pest known to hitchhike on shipping containers, importing items that come into Australia, and it is a massive biosecurity risk. That will be our topic today on the Detect and Protect podcast. Now, the carpra beetle, if established in Australia, this beetle can quickly spread and feed on stored grains such as rice and other dry food products. This could have a massive impact on industries that provide goods such as grains, rice and nuts. They are one of the world's worst grain pests and this is why we have strong measures in place to manage the risk that this poses for Australia moving forward. Today we'll be learning more about this pest, the risk that it poses and how it has been detected and especially by a member of the community here in Canberra where this podcast is being recorded. For today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Gabrielle Vivian Smith. She is Australia's Chief Plant Protection Officer, and it is my pleasure to welcome her to the podcast today. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Vivian Smith. Thanks very much, Steve, and it's a pleasure also to have the opportunity to talk to you about this pest today. Great to have you with us again, Dr. Vivian Smith, for our listeners to the podcast and also those that subscribe and tune into our webinar series. Dr. Vivian Smith was on one of those recently and she will be a fantastic guest for me today. She is extremely knowledgeable and holds a very important position in our department. First of all, uh, Gabrielle, could you please tell us a little bit about your role as Australia's Chief Plant Protection Officer and specifically uh, the things that you do that are very important? Sure. So the Chief Plant Protection Officer role in a formal sense is the primary representative of an advisor to the Australian Government on matters that relate to uh, plant health, so improving it, um, maintaining it, managing it, uh, and also working to um, support the systems underneath our plant, making sure that our plants remain healthy. So in essence, I I really work to protect Australia's plant-based industries as well as the natural environment from harmful and exotic uh, plant pests and diseases. I feel like biosecurity has really uh, expanded its focus now in the fact that it's, it's, it's a lot more prominent uh, in everyday people's lives and I think that be, uh, can be credited to the work that you've done, which, which is really good. Yeah, uh, in Australia we're really fortunate. We've got a very strong plant health system and uh, it's highly effective in managing biosecurity risks and It's really fundamental to uh, ensuring that we've got productive landscapes and competitive uh, plant industries as well as a sustainable environment. And I think Australia's um, positioned really well. We don't have a lot of pests and diseases that uh, exist overseas and in many other countries and uh, it gives us a really good reputational advantage as a provider of reliable, high-quality food um, that meets the world's growing food demands. I think that's very important as well, especially in this changing environment that we live in, uh, Gabrielle, that we continue to keep that pest-free status and continue to be leaders uh, in the agriculture and primary uh, primary resources uh, sector because it's such a big uh, thing these days, primary industries, and we're, we're a leader of that. Let's talk about the carpra beetle itself and why it is such a big risk for Australia moving forward. So it's a a uh, carpra beetle is a tiny little beetle, but it's Australia's number two uh, national priority plant pest. So these are it's number two on our hit list in terms of exotic um, pests and diseases. Uh, but for the grains industry, it's their number one priority plant pest for grains. And uh, in essence, um, it poses a really big risk for them. Uh, it's a really serious pest of stored grains and um, could cause major problems if it was to be found in a grain silo. Uh, and Uh, It also affects pretty much a whole range of different um, food products from rice to oil seeds uh, to dried foodstuffs such as dried fruit and nuts and herbs and spices. Um, So it can uh, affect quite a few different foodstuffs but it would really affect our grain and pulse industries because they're reliant on exports and if Australia's status changed uh, for capra beetle, currently it's not present in Australia, 
But if it was to establish in Australia, we would lose a lot of export markets, which are very lucrative and provide um, a massive income for the country um, and particularly our agricultural industries. Now, without going too much into geopolitics, we're in a, a tricky time in the world at the moment, but there has been a lot of reporting that there is a, going to be potentially a bigger reliance on Australia when it comes to exports in, in this near future period. So I'm assuming it's, it's fair to say, Gabrielle, that it's very important that you now we, we continue to keep things like our grain silos pest free and, and ensure that we can continue to export because it's, it's not purely just from the export market, but it's from you know, doing the best that we can to, to supply the world as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. So food security is really important um, from a global uh, geopolitical stability perspective. And Australia is a major exporter of food. We produce way more food than we can eat. And uh, so trying to make sure that we can continue to produce uh, food like wheat and other grain crops like chickpeas and, and pulses really effectively and really um uh, don't add to the cost and add to the need to use chemical um, treatments is, is really important. No, that's great to hear and I hope that continues and, and, and you continue doing that great job that you're doing. With regards to the carpet beetle, uh, Gabrielle, how can that arrive in Australia? Is it as basic as, as just through cargo, through airports, seaports and that type of thing? Or if you could elaborate on that for us, that would be, that'd be very interesting to hear. Sure. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the capra beetle because that explains uh, how it can arrive as well and why it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, so it, as I've mentioned, it uh, establishes itself in stored food products and so it's really dependent on the movement of uh, goods by humans. So human activities is really the main way it will spread to Australia. It can't really get here uh, through natural pathways like the wind or water. So it's really dependent on human activities. It's a tiny little beetle. It's only one to two millimetres um, long. And generally, the adults don't live for very long and they don't feed, but they produce a lot of eggs, tons of tiny little eggs, and they turn into small larvae. And the larvae are tiny and they're quite cryptic, which means that they like to hide. They hide in little cracks uh, in, in um, walls or in floors they can hide under the floors of sea containers and um, they can even hide underneath paint, uh, layers of paint. And they're very clever um, from a biological perspective in that they uh, can just hang around without very much food. They, they can actually live for 12 months without any food and they can live for maybe up to 10 years by just kind of having a snack every now and then when food becomes available and then going back into a state of uh, sort of dormancy or what we call in the insect um, entomology world a diapause. So they can just hang out there um, biding their time until food becomes available and if they're hanging out in sea containers or in um, uh, other areas where there's not a lot of food they just keep there at that very low level, very low level of population, just a few of them sometimes might be a bit more of higher populations. And then when the time and location uh, and temperature are right uh, and they've got food and they've got the right um, conditions, they'll just start to uh, feed and their populations can be quite explosive. So they're really hard to, to detect and they can come into the country in those types of foodstuffs. So they might come in um, with travellers, uh, with stuff in their bags um, people who might bring their favourite herb and spice uh, to Australia, not thinking that it um, much of it, or people who are bringing rice uh, in their personal goods when they're cha moving from one country to another, or even in the case we had a case a uh, number of years ago where um, there was a uh, wedding dress that uh, came in in personal goods uh, to Australia and it had the rice from the wedding uh, sprinkled wow, through wait. it. Uh, led to um, a detection of capra beetle. So they can come in in quite sneaky ways like that. 
They're a pretty unbelievable pest, Gabrielle, when you think about that. I mean, you, you spoke then a moment ago about going 12 months without food. I mean, I wish I could go 12 hours without food sometimes, but you know, you, I, they probably could learn a thing or two from the carpra beetle. But is it fair to say as well, Gabrielle, I've heard stories as well that, you know, they can, and you talk about that dire pause and that dormancy, but it, it can be it can be years, can't it? Like it can be up, upwards of three years, you know, five years, they just sit dormant in these containers and then all of a sudden, Bang! Okay, it's time to time to wake up now, and, and as you mentioned with those eggs, so it, it's it must be incredibly difficult um, when you think about that in terms of managing that. Just noting that you know you think about where a container's been in 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 three weeks, let alone five years. It's it's pretty crazy. That's right. So it, it does make it difficult. So whilst we used to find them a lot in uh, foodstuffs, uh, we're starting to see a different trend emerging, and that's where they've kind of. Uh, ha- started hanging out and building up in numbers in in uh, shipping containers mm-hmm, that once mm-hmm. upon a time uh, might have contained food uh, stuffs, uh, so a commodity, um, some sort of uh, grain commodity or maybe peanuts or something like that. And they've just been able to hang out there even though then subsequent shipments might have been uh, washing machines and refrigerators and who knows what uh, and until they get to the right spot. So... Um, the science, scientists have done work and they found that just with a, a sort of an intermittent little bit of food, they can last for ten, one um, sort of stage can last for up to 10 years. That's, a, that's the extreme. <laughs> 10 years now. That's the extreme. That's unbelievable. Under scientific conditions. But, um, but yeah, they, they are known to be able to last for quite a few years. So a shipping container that might have been contaminated three or four years ago um, can still pose a risk. Uh, when it arrives on Australia's doorstep um, and where the capra is is sort of lurking in a very cryptic, hidden away fashion under the floorboards. Absolutely. And I think that also uh, puts pay to some of the important programs that we have like sea container uh, cleanliness programs and hygiene programs to ensure that you know the movement of, of cargo uh, and bulk goods around the world can have these protections in place. Because as you said, it's so difficult when you have uh, not only a dishwasher or, a, or, or something like that, a white good moving around the world. Uh, you, you have grains, you have pests, you have the remnants of that. And that story about the wedding dress is amazing. Like I know in, in certain cultures and traditions, you'll throw, it could even just be a case of it's not from you know having a meal at a wedding but could be when you throw things like rice in the air or whatever the case may be it it catches in a a wedding dress and then you can inadvertently pick it up and and next minute it arrives and and we have a story here to talk about on the podcast so incredible uh little beetle that it is uh gabrielle next question i have for you is what the measures are that we have in place at the moment to keep it out but also to manage its impact if it did happen to arrive and, and and get itself set up here Right, so um, so we've got quite a few different uh, measures. So we've got a very robust uh, biosecurity system uh, in the first place. So there's multiple kind of layers uh, to our biosecurity system that help um, ensure that we're working offshore. So beyond our border, um, we're taking a really strong uh, approach at the border to manage any risks. Uh, risk-based approach, biosecurity risk-based approach, and then post-border as well. So we look at it in that way. Um, so we've been uh, really monitoring our detections of carpa beetle over the last, um, well, really, you know, quite, for quite some time. Uh, and that's an important part of our system because it tells us where we need to intervene on those biosecurity um, pathways and where the interventions or, or measures, as we often call them, uh, need to be either sort of ratcheted up a few notches um, or where we're doing a good job and we don't need to make any changes. And in some cases we might even relax them, although that's pretty unusual. Um, so uh, what we've been doing is we've been reviewing our measures uh, that we've got in place to ensure that we're managing the risk um, and, and it, the risk profile is, is updated and then making changes where we need them. So uh, in response to these increased detections and interceptions at the border that we've we've had over the last um, 24 months, uh, we've put in place a series of urgent measures, and they began in uh, September 2020. And they've been put, rolled out uh, in a kind of, um, I guess, a series of phases uh, over the last... Um, year and into the next year 
um, and the, they include a range of different uh, requirements. So uh, one of the requirements is mandatory offshore treatment of containers that have arrived from a country where we know capra beetle uh, is present. So they're considered to be fairly high risk. So, um, so, that's, so they target these different risk profiles. So and that, that would be all part of an, an assessment sort of process, I would yeah, assume. It's, it's, it's kind much. of a process of doing that research and all the scientists you have and, and everybody yeah. knowing sort of where the key areas are. Exactly, Steve. So we have a bunch of scientists doing or scouring the literature and um, ensuring that we've got the best possible biological and other information. And then we also use data. So we, we um, try and... Uh, scour the world for information on capra beetle and where it's show, shown up and then we use the data that we also gather ourselves uh, from the detections at the border. So that particular measure where we're trying, we're really just treating offshore so we're managing that risk before it arrives in Australia um, ensures that those containers are, are now free from capra beetle before they actually arrive here in the country which is great because the last thing we want is a capra beetle container to arrive in Australia and with its capra beetle in it um, or, heaven forbid, get, get filled with a commodity that's a foodstuff and just add to the global capra beetle problem by sending capra beetle plus their foods offshore um, to another country. So um, one of the other, uh, I guess, areas that we've been working on to collect data to really profile containers is looking at... Um, uh, using science, so using eDNA, uh, so the ge genetic code of capra beetle, and uh, using what we call eDNA, which is environmental DNA. So we use these vacuum cleaners to suck up uh, the dust inside containers, and then we put that through genetic uh, gene testing, gene genetic sequencing, uh, to, to determine whether there's uh, any evidence of capra beetle being present in that dust. So ha that's it, incredible. Yeah, it answers yeah. the question is has capra beetle been living in this container or not? And we've been um, finding <laughs> yeah, out for the last 50 things, years <laughs> interesting yeah. things there. Yeah. yeah, and the reason why we can do that is capra beetle, uh, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of different uh, life stages, but they're quite hairy uh, little insects and they're always dropping hairs. The adults often drop their wings and they might drop a leg or two. Um, and then uh, they're they because they shed their skins when they move from one uh, life stage to another, they leave their skins behind as well. So they're leaving a lot of DNA for us uh, as a signature um, to, that they've been there having a little holiday in a container. Of that being behind, that's right. And, and if there's one thing I could say here, and, I, and I'd love for you to, to stress the point as well, but this sort of all feeds into the work, the science, uh, and I know the technology and innovation that, that areas in our department are doing, for example, to try and sort of pick up things to scan even, you know, containers when they arrive on the wharf. But you'd have to agree with me here, Gabrielle, that Australia has always been very, you know, front and foremost in looking as primary prevention versus secondary prevention. I mean, we had that uh, concept with what happened with, with COVID-19 and we've seen that whilst being very you know tough on a lot of people in the country no doubt about that it's sort of been marked as the gold standard for for really trying to minimize you know death and and, and serious illness on on human health but when it comes to this side of things too you know primary prevention is our is our best way to do that to mitigate that risk offshore and 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 i'm sure you agree with that and, and would love to stress that point yeah you're absolutely uh dead right there steve particularly with calf per beetle because it it's a pretty tricky thing to um, get rid of once it establishes. So the key um, keystone really to our strategy with capra beetle is prevention and hence we're using throwing a lot of uh, innovation, new technology uh, at improving our ability to prevent capra beetle from entering the country. So we're looking at traceability systems for sea containers. Uh, we're looking at how we might improve the treatment of sea containers so that they're more hygienic. We're using cameras and artificial intelligence technology that sort of scans uh, images and um, uh, using other computer algorithms that are self-learning to help uh, improve our ability to detect uh, capra beetle and to monitor sea containers and um, be able to identify those that present a higher risk to Australia for pests like capra beetle but also other hitchhiker pests. 
And I know in my time in the department, Gabrielle, I've seen lots of advances in that. I mean, sort of when I started going back six to seven years ago, you know, the importance of a lot of the programs we ran offshore were, were hugely important, working with MPPOs and working with industry overseas to, to teach them how important it is for us. But seeing that technology develop has been something that I've really enjoyed. And I guess in a funny way, the, the pandemic led us to focusing a lot more on, on things like that in our own backyard here, how we can improve detection as opposed to getting out there and and seeing what's overseas. Um, a, a quick one for you, Gabrielle. This is going down the path now of, of potential more difficulty, but have there been any detections of the carp or beetle uh, at Australian borders to this point? Yes, look, we have had um, detections. So we've had a number of detections over the years. Um, they were quite spread out uh, and um, we would find that there, was, there was the wedding dress incident that I mentioned before. Uh, there's also been a detection in plastic beads uh, that was a bit perplexing a, a few years ago uh, and plastic containers a year or so before that. Uh, and then we find them from time to time in rice that's being imported and other personal goods like I mentioned before, the this, this herbs and spices. Um, but uh, some of the more interesting recent detections that we've had uh, have been um, really helped by the general public. We had one very, um, I guess, concerning one in 2020, and that was in imported refrigerator packaging. And uh, we also had another one which was a separate incident that year um, in packaging associated with imported high chairs. And uh, these detections were all, of course, successfully contained and treated and eradicated but um, we're particularly thankful to uh, the local uh, public for their eagle eyes. Um, the important detection in the refrigerator packaging was uh, by a Canberra man uh, who was, um, had just taken, uh, taken ownership of a new refrigerator and uh, his name was um, Brett uh, Burdett and he and his wife Donna noticed some live beetle larvae while they were unpacking the new refrigerator. Awesome. And they noticed awesome. that the beetles were in the packaging and had been shipped with the refrigerator and immediately thought this could be a biosecurity problem for Australia. They took photographs and uh, they um, contacted us when they realised that they didn't know what these beetles were and uh, we went right out there and um, took care of the problem for them. Not an everyday ladybug, is it, Gabrielle? That you see popping out of a popping out of your items like that in your in your backyard. That's it's such an incredible story. This one of how that all began, and I mean, yeah, this goes back to what I said a moment ago about people having that awareness of of biosecurity. You know, in the forefront of their minds now, they know that things like that are are odd. They're, they're unique in that circumstances and, and especially if you can't recognise it. I mean, I, I know I've seen a lot of great pictures of, of things like Carpra and, and things like BMSB. You can see when, when they when they infest and they go nuts. It's something that you really need to think about. So it's, it's a great story for Brett. I mean, when when that was dealt with, you know, and, and in your dealings with the circumstances, how surprised was he you know, in, in that circumstance? Was it something that really took him aback uh, when he found this sort of thing? Well, I didn't talk to him personally, but I think that he was surprised that this tiny little beetle the size of a grain of rice or possibly smaller could be something that was so important to Australia and so important to our agricultural industries. And, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think they were uh, quite impressed that they'd ma managed to find uh, this little beetle and um, the response that ensued after that in terms of uh, biosecurity concern and ensuring that, that that pest didn't establish. Absolutely. He deserves the key to the city perhaps because he's probably saved, you know, the country a lot of money as we've talked about. And, and I know you mentioned things like, you know, you mentioned things like the figures that are involved in, in these type of incursions as well. And, and they are mind boggling. You mentioned there a little bit about uh, what happened when, when that incidents was reported to the department uh, and the response. But could you tell us a, a little bit more about sort of the overall responses when, when these type of things happen and how we would sort of look to manage things at the different stages? I know in this case it was found, you know, in someone's home, it was reported, we were able to get out there and begin. But I know that uh, is part of the work that my section does uh, in, in compliance. Uh, there's areas where we were involved in the daily meetings and briefings and ensuring that we spoke to as many members of the public that were affected 
affected, um, you know, by things like these consignments as well. Because I know that there's been yep. you know other ones where there's not that one. But if you could explain that to us, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So the, when these incidents kick off, um, we have a, a pretty uh, good machine that kicks into gear. And in this case, there was quite a lot of tracking and tracing involved uh, just to isolate and establish just to ha- how the um, capra beetle had arrived with the refrigerator and tracking the, con- the container that originally um, the refrigerator was packed in, uh, tracking it back to the store uh, and, and ensuring that, w- that any capra beetles that might have um, escaped in the store uh, were dealt with. So there's quite a lot of uh, tracking and tracing back through the supply chain to the point of entry and managing the risk there. We also have, we're really fortunate in Australia in that we have um, also what's called the emergency plant pest response deed. And so that often kicks into gear um, and it, it's really good because it, uh, the Commonwealth has a role uh, the states and territory agencies are often our response agencies um, for any post-border incidents, and so we work very closely with them. They they uh, ramp up their emergency response arrangements and get their biosecurity officers out there doing uh, tracking and tracing, eradicating, working with the community. Um, but under the deed, we also have industry parties. So all the affected industry parties who are signatories to that deed uh, sit uh, with us and uh, work with us uh, through the technical and scientific details and uh, also are there for the decision making as well. So it, um, because we have had quite a few different plant incidents in the past such as citrus canker eradications, uh, it's quite a tested system and it really helps formalise the different roles uh, between the layers of government and uh, also the industries who have a stake uh, in in the actual incident itself, and um, ensures that we have good arrangements to to respond and eradicate any pests, and also we have cost sharing arrangements uh, that are in place, so everyone is able to contribute to the response as well. How important is that collaboration gap between not only the industries, the states and, and having that Commonwealth legislation behind it that sort of underpins all of that thing? I mean, is there is there certain areas that you think need to be stronger than others or is it just, I mean, because what I see is, is a hugely collegiate approach from everybody. I know when we had this circumstance take place, everybody was willing to get involved and looked, and, and, and to be quite frank, the members of the public were fantastic. Most people were really looking to help. So, you know, how important is that collegiate approach to ensure that we can get on top of these things as soon as possible? Yeah, it's look, it's really critical. Our biosecurity system uh, is, as I said, multi-layered and, and the community are a really big part of that as well. So we really try to make sure that all of our stakeholders are, are part of the system. And I think um, Australians generally have a strong awareness of biosecurity. Whenever they come back through their borders, uh, they, they, they see it in action. And um, we hearing the message on the plane, Gab, when you're about to get home, it's, it's exactly. something that's stuck with me my entire life. You always know that, right? I can't take this, I can't take that. I know that as an Australian, it's, it's very important. Yeah, that's right. And I think um, in terms of the, the different layers of government and industry working together with the community, I, I think, um, you know, we know that we're going to have to do it again uh, and again around the corner. So ensuring that we've all got really good uh, relationships and we can work through some of the tougher things, tougher decisions together um, and that we're all sharing our information as much as we, um, you know, can so that everyone's informed, they've got the same knowledge base to make the decisions. Uh, it requires a fairly high degree of trust and, uh, you know, mutual respect, all those sorts of values, but it works really well and um, I think we come out of it stronger and better and ready, more ready to tackle the next, uh, next one around the corner. The next one that comes, that's right. You spoke uh, before about uh, the great work of, of Brett in Canberra and, and the efforts that he did. Can you explain to our listeners uh, the best ways that communities can go about reporting potential biosecurity risks like Mr. Burdett did in, in the case that they see or or have a feeling that something's not right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we really encourage uh keep the community out there to uh, keep their eyes open and see if they 
uh, see an unusual insect or pest or a strange uh, looking um, symptom on a plant or just any any kind of unusual looking organism really uh, to take a look at it and report it. Uh, you can report, um, if you search for a reporter pest you can find uh, uh, our web page on the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment website and there's an online form and you can report it uh, through uh, the online form but if you want to just pick up the phone there's a number of uh, toll-free hotline numbers as well on the website there's one which uh, relates to if you find uh, a, a bug or a pest in um, imported goods containers or parcels and that's um, Sea Secure Report there's also the exotic plant pest uh, hotline as well which is if you see unusual pests and diseases out there in your garden or uh, on your farm and uh, we really encourage people to report it. It's really useful information for us. Often it's a native species or it's nothing to be worried about but um, in the case of Mr Burdett and his wife Donna it was something to worry about and we're really um, really thrilled and pleased that we've got members of the public out there uh, really with their eyes on the ground and, and able to um, let us know when they see something unusual like that. And willing to do it, right, Gab? I mean, that's, that's oh, an yeah, important absolutely. thing too is that there's, there's no hesitation to pick up the phone. And, and I think that's a great example there if you have a circumstance where, okay, it's turned out to be something that we have here that is now, you know, native to the country or endemic or whatever the case may be. It's still better to get that answer and get somebody out to inspect it than say, okay, well, I didn't do anything. And then, because then we can have a real problem, can't we? If, it's, if, if things get, get away from us too quickly, we're in, we're in real trouble. Yeah, it, it's um, absolutely the case, Steve. Uh, if we can uh, prevent things from establishing, that's fantastic. If we can stop them at the border, that's even be better. Um, but if they have established or if they're setting up a new population and they're an invasive species or an exotic plant pest or disease, uh, it's much, much um, more cost-effective and much more feasible for us to get onto them really early rather than wait till they've spread further and then we've got to spend um, a huge amount more money, ta it takes more time and there's more uncertainty as to whether we'll actually be successful in eradicating those pests or not. And sometimes the consequences to our uh, primary production industries can be really great and um, also to our natural environment as well. Yeah, that's very tough and especially here in a country which prides itself on its, you know, its big farming background and, and all the work that we do on the land, that's very important. You made a point a moment ago uh, again then about those detections and, and, you know, things at the border, that primary prevention, just making a mention now about industry and importers and a lot of the people that have such a big role to play uh, in goods that come in and out of the country, what can they do to help keep CARPRA away? So... Uh the way that some of the things that they can do are um, just to be a, aware of capra beetle, uh, make sure that their staff who are working on their premises along that um, supply chain, uh, so warehouses, um, importers' premises, uh, are aware of what bugs to look out for, particularly capra beetle, the size of the capra beetle, it's tiny, and um, ensuring that uh, also that seed containers um, that are arriving are clean. Um, and uh, re really just making sure that they're part of a, a supply chain where everyone's got um, their eyes out, they've all got a part to play with this um, and we find that um, we're really grateful to those uh, along the supply chain um, in the warehouses who pick up the phone when they see something unusual and give us a call so we can get out there early and, and take care of um, what a, whatever uh, it, pest or disease it is. We've also, um, so for those who are uh, dealing with containers, uh, I can't emphasise enough the importance of clean, cleanliness in containers. A quick sweep out um, might seem good, but we really would like people to take a bit more care and, and get into those cracks and crevices <laughs> in the case of capra beetle. We recently created a short video on sea container cleanliness. We've got quite a lot of material on our website, so I'd encourage you all to visit the DOOR website. Um, perhaps put in the, uh, maybe search on Google sea con container cleanliness and um, uh, give the video a watch.
Absolutely, and we'll look to get a lot of those links as well in, in, in these podcasts as we've done with, with previous episodes. It provides lots of background for all of our listeners. Gabrielle, one last question for you today. Um, it, this one's a little bit more broad uh, for you, but I just wanted to ask sort of what you see as, as, as the key priorities yourself personally. As I mentioned, you're in a very prominent uh, role in the department. So when it comes to, to pests and, and plant health overall, what do you see as the most important things as we move into sort of 2025 and and 2030 moving forward? So one of the key areas uh, is just really scanning the horizon, our sort of horizon and making sure that we're um, keeping track of what's going on out there uh, in the real world beyond our borders and um, just making sure that we're looking at what threats, what pests and diseases might be emerging uh, overseas in particular and preparing for those. We had one recently, the fall armyworm, which arrived in Australia through natural uh, pathways. and uh, The armyworm. Yeah, the old <laughs> fall armyworm, which is quite quite a nasty yeah. one really, but um, does, it sounds like a bit of fun. But um, anyway, it uh, so the, the, being prepared for the next um, pest, uh, supporting surveillance, so it, having industries that support surveillance programs um, to enable that early detection and an effective response. I think that innovation is going to continue to uh, remain really important in uh, plant health. So continuing to be innovative, support our uh, scientific researchers, trying new things, testing new technology uh, to give us um, that technological advantage um, is also going to be quite important. And then I think um, we just need to continue to remember that pest prevention being prepared, being able to respond to pests and diseases is really a critical part of our toolkit in plant health. Magnificent, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for all of that. The, the, the best part about that was is, is you've really covered off a lot of the key messages and, and, and take-homes from today, and that is that we need to keep an eye open into the future, watch carefully what's happening uh, around us every single day. And, and I think the work that you guys do in looking offshore and, and seeing emerging threats uh, as they come through and being able to act on them are very, very important. It's also uh, important for us to make sure that as a community we, we stick together, that we continue to look out for biosecurity risks. And if you're unsure, make that call. Uh, and at the same time, anybody who's working in the industries you know, when it comes to importing, exporting, um, and, and also the movement of cargo around the world. You, you made a lot of very important points there about sea container cleanliness, and I encourage everybody, please, to look at the Dawa website uh, and see the ways that we can we can continue to keep things clean and and primary prevention. That that is such a, a key component of it all. So, um, Gabrielle, I'd like to say a very very big thank you to you for joining me today. You're always a fantastic guest, and, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in a podcast again soon, or or another webinar, or something where we can hear you speak very interestingly about all the wonderful things uh, in your world as the Chief Plant Protection Officer. Thanks so much again, Gabrielle. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve. It was a great opportunity. Absolutely. Great podcast once again. Thanks very much, Gabrielle. And a big thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into our podcast today. Uh, as we've talked about thoroughly uh, through the podcast today, you can find out more information on Australian biosecurity on the department's website or by visiting biosecurity.gov.au. There's also some information there uh, if you use the forward slash CARPRA hyphen urgent hyphen action. So that's A W E gov.au forward slash carpra k h a p r a hyphen urgent hyphen actions and we'll look to put all of those links in the episode description as well make sure you subscribe to our biosecurity series to get updates on future topics and learn more about australian biosecurity we have another podcast that will be coming out once again in a few weeks time with some more interesting information but for now please enjoy uh, this podcast over and over again, Gabrielle Vivian Smith, the Chief Plant Protection Officer, talking about our hairy little friend, the carpet beetle. Thanks very much, everybody. I've been Steve Pales, and we will see you once again on Detect and Protect, the Australian Biosecurity Podcast, very soon. Mm-hmm.